Hey guys, in this video, let's talk about 10 reverb mistakes that might be ruining your mix. These are 10 things that I wish I would have known when I first started. They're all timestamped in the description, so if you know one, feel this feel free to just skip it and go to the next one. Here's a song that I'm writing in Logic, and as always, we're gonna use this as an example uh, while we're talking about these uh, 10 reverb mistakes. I'll be using two reverb plugins in this video. One is the free Logic Pro one, it's called Space Designer, and the other one is a paid reverb plugin called Valhalla Reverb. It's one I use a lot. However, it doesn't matter what reverb plugin you use, I won't be getting into different types of reverb plugin companies or third-party companies. It doesn't matter anyways, and every 10 thing I'm gonna get into right now is will be available in whatever reverb plugin you use, I guarantee it. So don't doesn't matter if you're using like a stock Pro Tools or Ableton or, or whatever. Number one in the first mistake that I did when I first started music, producing music was not knowing the mix level of your reverb. What I often see in a lot of beginners it's, it's, is that the mix knob is set to too much or set not enough getting that right balance between your mix. And in the Valhalla Vintage Verb, it's the mix knob. And in the Space Designer Reverb, it's the wetness knob. You can think of the, the mix knob or the wetness knob as how much reverb you're actually giving the, the audio signal. The more mix, the more wetness you give an audio signal, the more reverb it will have. The less, the less reverb it will have. If I'm working on this lead vocal and I'm adding a Valhalla Reverb, and I'm trying to play with the mix knob, but I'm just listening to it in solo. Lots of reverb, right, on that vocal. Maybe that sounds good on its own, but in context with the acoustic guitars and the rest of the song, way too much, right? So you have to listen, use the mix as your a tool in context with other instruments and mix it in with your other instrumentation. To clarify your mind, help me recognize your smoke signs. That's kind of where it sounds good to me right now. And as you add more instrumentation and as you produce your songs, you might change these dials. Now let's get on to the second mistake I often see and what and one I did when I started producing music is not understanding what pre-delay is. So pre-delay in the Valhalla of Reverb is another kind of knob here, and it says pre-delay. In Logic One, it says pre-delay, and it's in milliseconds, right? Both are in milliseconds. Let's take the lead vocal, let's just dial in on the Valhalla Vintage Verb, and let's turn the pre-delay up so you can really, really hear it. Notice, you're gonna hear my voice, and then behind it, it's gonna be the reverb, and I'm gonna add more mix so you can really notice it. Trying to clarify your mind Help me recognize your smoke signs. Shoot a flare into the sky, start a fire. You can hear that, right? You hear the reverb behind it. It sounds very much like a delay. It's because it actually is a delay. The reverb is a delay. This is a mistake that you're doing if you're just beginning or you don't know what pre-delay is, is sometimes it can be distracting and just like making everything messy because your reverb isn't at the proper pre-delay to make your track sound as good as it can be. So technically you can increase the pre-delay if you want to make it perceive that the singer is closer to you, but there's still like a bigger space behind them. Now the benefit of using the logic one here is I'll show you, you can quickly set it to a note value by pressing this music note. So if it's a quarter note, that means that the, the it's actually a quarter note time because quarter notes like eighth note, 16th notes, chord notes, uh, whole notes, half notes, they are all can be attributed to a millisecond value, right? And there's a cool tool on Google, it's called the Delay and Reverb Time Calculator, you can just search that. If you choose the BPM of your song, whether that's 80, you know, 100 or whatever, it gives you the pre-delay values of your notes. That means your your reverb pre-delays will actually be in rhythm with your song. Think of it like the pre-delay knob is separating you, like you the singer, from the reverb. If you lower the pre-delay, the reverb and the singer are gonna be like really tight. And as soon as you bring up the pre-delay like this, that means you're separating the reverb from the singer. I hope that helps, but I think the best thing is just to me to quickly go through you hearing it, because after all, we need to hear it to really fully learn. So watch as I start with zero pre-delay, 
at a healthy mix because I want you to hear the reverb. And then I'm going to bump it all the way up and then I'm going to slowly bring it down and see how what changes with the vocal. If you're trying to clarify your mind, help me recognize your smoke signs. Shoot a flare into the sky, start a fire in the night, untie your smoke signs. So the mistake you want to avoid there is doing too much pre-delay when you don't need it. And if you want to look at the dotted calculator, you can look at the tool uh, online, or if you're using the Logic Pro Note 1, you can just click the note value. The third mistake that I often did when I was just beginning was using too long of a decay or sometimes too short of a decay. And by the way, all these 10 things, there's no priority to order or order to any of them. And also, um, they will work uh, in tandem with one another, like decay, pre-delay, uh, mix, EQing, and the, the rest of the ones we're going to get into. You have to kind of know them all and work a little bit on all of them on every plugin uh, whenever you're going to add reverb. This one is Decay, and this one's pretty simple and one that you're likely familiar with when you're, if you use any type of reverb. In the Valhalla Vintage, it's just this big Decay knob. It's in seconds. And then in the Logic Pro one, uh, where is it? Here we go. Length. So in seconds as well. If it only goes up to a max of 1.83 seconds, here, see how I can't make it any bigger? That just means you have to choose a larger reverb up here. Let's drop down factory default. So if I go to like a larger space, like a, yeah, upper echelon, I can have a longer reverb. The longer your reverb is actually saying, like in this situation, 2.02 seconds, the reverb is going to last that long. So sometimes if you want a really lush sounding vocal, it's, it's nice to have a little bit of a decay so you can really hear that vocal and it sounds very, very cool and it sounds very atmospheric. If you want something to be tight and sound more upfront, you'd probably have it shorter, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.9 in that, in that area. So you don't, you aren't really noticing it, but it's still adding the texture of reverb. You can't go too wrong with adding too short of a decay, but it, it, what you're going to miss out is that you might be missing out on some some cool empty space that you could fill with reverb or some cool lushness that could be filled with that decay. However, once you start adding on instruments and you're having a lot of decay on all your tracks, it's just gonna sound way too reverby. So you gotta pick the right reverb. Don't get carried away. A beginner mistake is like you just, you might have a vocal with a six second reverb. Do you really need a six second reverb on that? Do you really need 10 seconds on something? Mm -hmm. To know reverb, you can't, you, of course, you can solo it out and listen to it on its own, but mix in the decay with other things. For example, if I'm mixing in a, a concert hall reverb on a lead vocal with my acoustic guitars. If you're trying to clarify your mind, help me recognize your smoke signs. Sounds like there's tons of space behind the vocalist. It sounds really, really cool. It's too much. And I know that because I've already produced this song a little bit. I know what other instrumentation is behind it. Bring that back to a tasteful amount and mix in in context with other instruments. Always remember in context. What number are we on now? Four, right? Yeah, four. Fourth beginner mistake that I see, and again, one I was guilty of when I started producing music is choosing the wrong type of reverb. I'm not referring to the plugin, but I'm referring to the, the room. You could think of it as like, are you going to be in a church? Are you going to be in a club, a, a hall? There are so many different types of reverbs because reverbs just come from the spaces that you're in. But there are there are reverbs that you would cons that you would see consistently across these plugins. For example, um, concert hall, plate reverb, room reverb. The, these names you're going to likely see in your those reverb plugins that you're using. Sometimes I just see beginners just putting the wrong room, and it just it just it's hard for the listener to distinguish sometimes where where the singer is if you if there is a band sound in the song where it's like drums, bass, guitars, but then the lead singer is in like a church. It's like, it doesn't mean it's wrong. And again, a lot of this stuff, it doesn't mean that you're wrong. It's just, these are best practices that you can follow to make it more consistent with what else is happening. With the Valhalla verb here, we have different modes. That's what I meant by type or room. And you can see 
We have halls, plates, rooms, choruses, ambiances, chambers. In the Logic Pro one, we have modes up here as well. We have all these large spaces and these medium spaces, small spaces, and warped effects. If you don't know like what to start with, you can look at the decay times here. The smaller decay times is the smaller the the room. The bigger the decay time is the you, you can consider at that as a bigger room. The fifth mistake I see uh, beginners do, and I didn't start doing this for a long time afterwards. I didn't know this that, that this was a thing, and it's probably if I was to choose anyone in this ten, it would be this one. Is to actually I I'm saying that out loud, and I I don't know if I could say that, but anyways, EQing your reverbs really really huge you can eq the reverb within the reverb plugin i pretty much i'm willing to guarantee that every plugin will have its ability to eq the reverb within the plugin so with valhalla you can see on the right side here we have eq low and high and then the logic it's on uh output here eq at the top and we have kind of like the interface of a, a logic channel eq Remember when I was talking about pre-delay and the second one is when you increase the pre-delay, you separate, you can kind of think of it as like separating the reverb from the singer. Now, when you think of it like that in that term, you you start to consider that, hey, the reverb is actually its own thing. Think of it as just more sound being added to the your mix. So with EQ, you EQ the sound of the reverb, not the singer. Okay, that's the that's really something you need to distinguish. You're not EQing the singer's vocal, you're EQing the reverb. And if you when you EQ the reverb, you are minimizing the chance your mix will sound muddy because if you don't, you're just having all this reverbs clash everywhere. So the a good rule of thumb is to always low cut your reverb and I'll kind of keep it at there right now. So if it's on a lead vocal, Notice how I low cut, I had it around like 480 or something. Usually it's probably default around around here. I like to really line low cut my reverb, sometimes up to five, 600, depending on, you know, and again, in context, mis mixing this in with the song. And then in Logic, it would look like something like this, having maybe a bit of a lower slope having it around, you know, 390, 400 again. So it's cutting away all that muddiness from your reverb. A couple of mistakes that I did at the beginning, and here's another one, we're at number six, is whether or just putting reverb on your insert. And what I mean by insert is like going to Logic Pro and just adding your space designer on the plugin channel strip, just like that as a plugin. Fine, you can do that. There's no wrong answer, right? But where you can maybe open up another door in your kind of headspace of production is adding the reverb as a bus track instead. It gives you more flexibility to customize the sound of the reverb. So adding a bus track in Logic is quite simple. You can go to the kind of gray little horizontal bar here, add a bus. I'm going to do this quickly because I, I do have other videos on how to bus send, If you but meet us in those videos if you need to understand how to... Uh, create a bus. Essentially though, when you have the reverb on its separate bus track here, I can now kind of move this reverb over and I'll move the space designer over too. So the reverb is actually on the bus and you can control the volume of this aux seven. This is actually our reverb down here now. I can control the amount of reverb volume is being added to the track. And this really helps open up your mental model and kind of mixing and production as the reverb is completely separate to the dry signal of your vocal. If you have, don't lower the volume of your reverb, it's gonna be fighting with your dry vocal, right? So you mix in the sounds together, technically just mix in the reverb sound volume. So it sits with the dry vocal giving you a really nice reverb sound. Notice how I can just add other plugins here. I can add, add, add any plugin I want. Compression, distortion, delay, more reverb. The benefit here is you can add a channel EQ and you can really dial in on the sound of your reverb. You can do this in the plugin, right, too, but you just have a bit more flexibility here because you can also add, let's say if we wanna add distortion, as reverb is a separate thing, I can now distort 
like, here's your dry vocal, here's your reverb. I can now distort that reverb and then like, cr cr like compress it, crunch it, make it sound really cool, and then mix in that cool sound with the dry signal. That's the benefit of using reverb as a bus end, not only as an insert. Both are right, but you would use both in different situations. The number seven mistake I often see beginners do, and you might be doing this in your mix, again, I do this, I did it so much, is you don't use automation. There's no type of peaks and valleys or dynamics in your song with regards to reverb. If automation is an, a new term to, for you, please check out some of the other videos I have on automation. And I'm gonna use this track we we created in the previous, uh, previous point here. I'm gonna create this track by right clicking. I can automate now this reverb throughout the, the song. So if I just open up A and I click in this line, this is this gen, this line here up and down is, is the, signifies the volume of the reverb. In my chorus section, if I want the reverb to be louder, I would make the volume louder. This is a very simple example. And then in the second verse here, if I want the volume reverb to be quieter, I would make it quieter. I can also put it right down to zero. But you can go so far as in as to dialing in on specific phrasing of the words. For example, what if what about if this word you want it to have like a shine of reverb, or you want it to duck the reverb so it sounds really um, dry? These are very simple examples of what you might do, and that creates dynamics, peaks and valleys in your song, which really really separate you from kind of a beginner to a pro level is doing that automation and really dialing in on it because you're gonna have to listen back here and be like, is that too much? Should it maybe fade in? Should it curve in? I can go to my automation curve tool and like curve that in maybe something like this. This is where the fine detail of production work comes into play. Grain of salt kind of caveat, word to the wise, whatever, insert other acronym or buzz word there is, you don't always need automation. Uh, I kind of, I love putting automation on things because I like the dynamics it gives in the style of music that I make. But again, it's the style of music. It's the, what you're creating that you need to answer to. You don't always need automation. Number eight mistake that you might be making that can make your mix sound ugh, just not at the level you want it to be is too many types of reverbs where you have to ask yourself as a producer and someone that uses reverb to create spatial three dimensions is, what do you want your song space to look like? Or to sound like, actually. When you listen to a song, especially when I listen to a song, I'm like listening, right? I'm not looking, but in your, in my mind, I'm kind of like, oh, this sounds like a stadium song. It sounds huge. Or this is, this is like a dry kind of folk sound. You can, whatever the mood is, you picture it, right? Like a Jack Johnson song, if you're listening to that. Do you picture him on a, in a stadium? Like, no, you you picture him in a cafe on on the, like by the water or by the ocean because their choice of reverbs and instrumentation puts you in that environment. But if you listen to maybe like a new Ed Sheeran pop song, those are pretty big songs and yours will be different too. So you kind of have to ask yourself, where do you want your listener to picture where your song is going to be? And that does all, a big part of it comes down to the choice of reverbs you make on all your instrumentation. So the mistake is not understanding what you want your song to really sound like and to to be like like what's what do you, what where's your end goal and not choosing that end goal and then you end up with just being like a song that has too many too much flavor <laughs> in in a bad way number 9 thanks for sticking with us by the way throughout this whole video if you're here still on number 9 not everything needs reverb i love reverb and i still try to put it on everything but i have to like kill my darlings sometimes and just say you know does this like track need reverb. Sometimes it doesn't. Although it sounds awesome when you put something on it, it's not always of benefit because again, it's a it's more sound, right? Every time you add something to your mix, it gets harder to mix. So you have to ask yourself, why are you adding reverb? Like, does it need it? Um, most of the time it might need it because you want to put it in a bit of a space to help the listener and to create that three dimension. Always have that little person on your, like that little devil on your shoulder to be like, do you really need this? Like, I know it sounds good, but like, why do you need it? Number 10 mistake. And you know, as I'm saying this now out loud, there's nothing wrong. I said this before, right in the video, like there's nothing 
there's no wrong answers, but this is a mistake I did that I haven't really seen other people, any professional do. I used to put reverb on the master track and have um, all the tracks collect a bit of that reverb so it would sound like it's in one space. And although I thought like at the beginning that does make sense, like, oh, a reverb on the master track will put everything in the bay in, in the same space. As soon as you start understanding the value of like uh, bus sends of reverb, you, you begin to understand it's not productive to put it on the master track. If you want more of this type of video and you want me to help you out on your music journey, here's another video here where you can watch. And please remember to subscribe. It does mean a lot and it really supports the channel.